Hello, can anyone hear me? Just testing the sound. Hello, is there anybody there to test the sound? Has the meeting started? I can't hear anything. Thank you. Designers use all the time, so that's why they came up with this. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Jumping in, yeah. Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. The Salon, no, nothing from the Salon. That way, and then the break came in after was. But I got caught by the wind. They must have been right right after each other because I was to hear it. You couldn't have been behind them. I was. Him. Right here in Oh. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for today's uh, meeting of the Kane County Energy and Environmental Committee. Um, today is Friday, April 12th. I am still Mavis Bates. So welcome to uh, E&E. Um, clerk, please call the roll. Alan? 
Okay. Caius? Caius present. Roth? Roth here. Strathman? Strathman here remote. Young? Here. Tarver? Tarver's here remotely. Bates? Bates, yes. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, may I have uh, your consensus? to allow Mr. Tarver and Ms. Strathman to attend remotely and uh, possibly Ms. Allen, if she joins. No problem. Or that make it so. Um, would you text um, Bev Allen, please? Yeah. Welcome, Ms. Allen. Good morning. I'm on my way. Oh, well, even better. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I have <laughs> consent? May I have unanimous consent to approve the uh, minutes? Madam Chair, I would ask for unanimous consent for very much. Second. The approval of the minutes from what was the date? 15. March 15th. May I have a second? Yes. Don't need it. Okay. Well, unanimous consent. Don't need it? Okay, I'll get this. No objection. And I thought I did so well so far. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, is there any comment um, from <laughs> I, online or it. in person? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Wait till we try to do the tree ordinance. We'll have plenty of company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no public on or off agenda. Okay. Um, Ms. Wolnick is um, not in attendance today. Ms. Hinshaw, are you going to? Uh... I think um, I, can, I can do mine if you want mine to go first, but mine's at the very end. Well, the um, is Jody coming? She's on vacation. Oh, she's on vacation. Aren't her representing us okay. today. Okay, we have oh. today. Oh. Okay, well then, why don't we jump right into uh, the talk about the uh, proposed hydrogen storage facility, which I believe had a little bit of um, back and forth about what we're going to call this. So yeah, I'm not sure. This is Mark Van Kirkhoff, uh, Kane County Development Department, and uh, this is something Director Wellnick and I have been uh, involved with uh, with Madam Chairman uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Bates uh, was involved in one of the meetings. Um, but starting to take a look at uh, hydrogen, uh, which is a very uh, old uh, source of uh, fuel, but that's gaining a lot of interest. And uh, uh, so it's kind of a crossover topic between uh, economic development and uh, um, environmental. Well, we are called energy, energy and environmental. So, so uh, um, all the all the above. Uh, so this is just uh, an update. I guess we weren't sure what to call it. Um, so I, I have a presentation for you, um, kind of get you up to speed. I call it Kane County, the emerging hydrogen economy, uh, for lack of a better Well, term. that's a very cool title. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so this is just meant to be uh, for discussion purposes, just kind of a broad overview of, of what we're learning and, and kind of where uh, the county could be uh, headed uh, if the, uh, the board chooses to do so. So first of all, as I mentioned, hydrogen is an alternative source of clean energy. Uh, there's a lot of renewed interest globally, nationally, and regionally. Uh, there's a lot of emerging options for making clean hydrogen. Um, some of you may be familiar with the hydrogen rainbow, uh, but uh, there's a renewed interest, uh, particularly at the federal level, on clean hydrogen. Uh, there are significant environmental and economic potential for our region because of the uh, uh, high volume of uh, heavy-duty trucks and equipment and aviation and trains. Uh, King County is working to be ahead of the curve in planning for and welcoming appropriate components of the hydrogen economy as we're learning about it. How can we best engage um, the broad spectrum of opportunities uh, to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we're ready and welcome, kind of like King County was early on in the uh, electric vehicle and, uh, and solar, other uh, clean energy alternatives. Uh, some of the partners that we're working with, and I'm using partners here loosely, um, nothing formal. But we've been meeting with uh, the city of Belgium, who likewise has historically been very progressive in their uh, attention to um, approach to sustainability and clean energy. Uh, Nightcore Gas, Pace Suburban Bus, the CPKC Railroad, and the Midwest Alliance for Clean Hydrogen. So I'll start with the Midwest Alliance because that's the, the bigger regional picture. Uh, they uh, have a, a project or uh, that they're calling uh, Mach H2. It's a multi-state coalition of public and private entity, entities representing every phase of the hydrogen um, continuum. Uh, they, uh, probably the big news for them is uh, uh, fall of last year, they were selected as one of the uh, five hydrogen hubs um, nationally. 
Uh, they were mainly selected because of their proposal to use nuclear power uh, as well as uh, some other uh, streams um, to uh, get their proposal um, on the board. Uh, there's some things going on in Washington in terms of the rules and, and everything, but you can learn uh, more and follow them at mockh2.com. Um, but that's something that's happening in the region that uh, we're looking to how can we best integrate and be coordinated with their uh, efforts. So this is a really busy slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but this is probably the best illustration I've seen of just uh, how complex and diverse the, uh, the hydrogen um, economy can be. Uh, you'll see it kind of hit some of the big parts, industrial facilities, agriculture, heavy duty trucking, aviation fuel, uh, energy story, storage, a little bit more information on uh, hydrogen. Again, this is from uh, a couple of our uh, people involved with that, Midwest Alliance for Clean Hydrogen and Constellation uh, Energy, uh, which is our local nuclear power uh, provider. So there are some uh, hurdles and there's some opportunities. Some of the hurdles are the economics. Uh, that's one of the reasons the federal government is involved uh, to try to get that cost down, some of the goals that they have. Uh, connective infrastructure, storage and transportation are challenges. Uh, that's one of the reasons uh, I think NICOR is getting into the game. Uh, they already have a network of pipelines. Uh, technology development is something that a lot of people are working on and then some of the process conversions. Um, but on the positive side, uh, creating more clean energy jobs, reducing greenhouse gas emissions could be huge for the Chicago region, positioning America or the region, Kane County, to compete in clean energy. And there are some goals or some projections that by 2050, hydrogen economy could generate greater than $3 trillion in annual revenue uh, nationally. Uh, NICOR, as I mentioned, is also looking into this. Uh, this is a slide they had uh, shown us. Um, kind of gives you an idea of where the uh, hydrogen infrastructure and production is uh, currently uh, heaviest. You can see down in the uh, uh, Texas uh, Gulf Coast area, uh, Chicago's on the map. They kind of have some projections by 2050 uh, how where some of the uh, the needs for hydrogen is going to be. So that's what the hydrogen is looking at, or uh, NICOR is looking at how to integrate hydrogen in their gas pipelines. Um, I didn't know this before, but they can blend uh, natural gas and hydrogen. So they're particularly looking at how they can do that with some of their industry existing um, heavy uh, natural gas users in, in industry. So they so people would be using a blend of natural gas and hydrogen? They could be, yeah, fuel? particularly in like uh, industrial uh, use. Okay. So and they're able to blend it within their pipeline. Yeah, planter. that's a good example. <laughs> they could actually, could they actually also separate it? Microphone is sticking to? up to Sorry. me. Wrong question. Um, could they actually separate it, you know, transport it, blend it, and then separate it at the destination that i don't know i hadn't heard them mention blending it and then separating i've heard more of a blending as a way to transition um the infrastructure and the users over to hydrogen help build the demand right um one of the challenges is it's a bit of a chicken and an egg where right. you've got <laughs> it's really expensive to make and there's not a lot of users and you know right. we need to kind of work on both ends of the equation at the same time uh, but this, you know, caught our attention from uh, NICOR in uh, that they uh, think that the hydrogen market in Illinois could be as large as uh, 654 million by 2030 and over 4.6 billion by 2050. So I think that's significant and and something that uh, we, you know, I think King County could look at making sure we're part of being ready for that uh, level of activity. Uh, they have customer interest uh, in transportation, manufacturing, oil refining, chemicals, synthetic fuels, and power generation. And then our other uh, a local entity who's shown interest in uh, the hydrogen economy is uh, PACE. So this is from their uh, Project Zero, uh, their emissions commitment, action item number four uh, that they have published to investigate emerging alternative fleets. I specifically note that transit agencies across the nations have been investigating, piloting, and operating alternatives such as hydrogen fuel cell electric buses. Um, down in Will County, they actually have a company who's uh, making hydrogen fuel cell uh, engines for long haul trucking. 
Uh, so that technology is beginning to emerge and uh, beginning to be adapted. As you may know, uh, PACE has a large facility in Elgin, uh, so that could be a, a potential uh, for them you know, moving to a hydrogen fuel cell uh, electric buses. So some of the opportunities we see for King County. Can I yes. ask a question? Just, I don't want to interrupt too much here, but you said that in Will County, there's a, a company making uh, engines, hydrogen engines for long haul trucks. Is it just in the, it's not commercially available, is it? Or is it, or is it commercially? It is commercially available. I've been following them. It's called Hyzon Motors, H-Y-Z-O-N. Uh, and they have, I think now, signed some contracts with at least one company in California for using their hydrogen fuel electric cell uh, trucks. Um, they're pretty cool. I did a tour of their facility about a year and a half ago, and um, they're very quiet. <laughs> uh, but the uh, engines are quiet or the facilities? The, uh, the both. <laughs> at least type lift? I'm not sure. Both, but the uh, uh, the the trucks themselves, I mean, because they put the engine and the fuel cell electric uh, components into a regular semi-truck cab. Uh, but they have a lot of good information on, on their website as well. And there's an, at least one other company that's in the uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric long haul trucking space. But Hyzon happens to be in the region. Product? Yes. Oh, let's go. <laughs> I, I hear a field trip, I think. Down in Bolingbrook. All right. We could have our next meeting there. Can you spell it again, Mark? -Y -Z -O -N. I think it's H Y Z O N. Hyzon. Hyzonfuelcell.com. H Y Z O N fuelcell.com. But they're making the trucks, right? Oh, well, they're making the engines, it looks oh, like. Engines? I'm going to check it out. It an or a motor? It's a oh, fuel cell system. Well, I'll have to learn more Single about stack this. 200 kilowatt fuel cell system, <laughs> according to the website. Okay, so uh, some of the opportunities we see in Kane County, uh, number one, uh, workforce training. Uh, we hear that a lot in workforce. Our, uh, both our community colleges are building new manufacturing and, and uh, certification uh, facilities. Uh, you know, for that to be on their list of looking at how, you know, what kind of uh, jobs are going to be needed for uh, hydrogen um, economy. Uh, identify local sites for pilot facilities for storage and fueling. I already mentioned the PACE facility in Elgin. Uh, we have a really large truck stop um, at uh, 20 and I-80 or I-90. Um, so that's, you know, that could be an opportunity uh, for a fueling center. So we have some opportunities. We're also close to, you know, uh, both Rockford and O'Hare airports and our local airports. So there's some opportunities for aviation. And then the CP Casey Railroad, um, they already have uh, hydrogen powered uh, engines running both in their rail yard up in uh, Canada and they developed one for doing long haul. Uh, and they're working with some of the other railroads to uh, cooperate in development of hydrogen powered train engines. Um, both staff and our lobbyists are researching a variety of uh, Department of Energy programs that will support our hydrogen future. Uh, there's a lot coming kind of fast and furious, and we're trying to take a look at uh, what of those, you know, might be something that Kane County, you know, could participate in or partner in or, or make sure our communities are aware of uh, that we might, that might be available for us. So that's where we're at, and I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, I'm going to call on Mr. Tarver first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, can you bring, the, bring back that, la oh, that is the last slide, the bottom bullet point. Can you share what work is being done with our lobbyists and staff on researching uh, this to King County? Sure. So that's been uh, uh, myself, um, uh, John Gruling, who's our economic development advisor, and uh, Greg Bales. Bales. Uh, our lobbyist has been uh, really helpful and just kind of sending our way some of the opportunities that uh, are coming out of the federal government. Have any programs been identified that we would really want to pay close attention to? Uh, they have sent a few our way that we're taking a look at. I haven't had an opportunity to dive into them uh, yet, but be happy to keep you posted on that. Wonderful. Thank you for the presentation. Sure. Thank you. Ms. Incha. I also wanted to add that we added three or four 
action plans and our climate action plan implementation plan. And I can present that all about hydrogen. Okay, great, great. Mr. Roth. Roth here, I have a few questions. Um, the programs you're working in, well, one, could you send the presentation to everyone? Please. Yeah, absolutely. I, I finished or it up Jody yesterday. Can when she gets so. back. Yeah. yeah, we can have it posted on okay. the, uh, the website. We can send that out. And then, and also I would be interested in some of the programs that we're looking at. Um, my resource at the national level is saying that the trucking industry is buying completely into hydrogen. Good. Because the batteries are too heavy to do on semis. Yeah, that's the perfect. And thing. it's a limited infrastructure to have to upgrade, just truck stops. Mm -hmm. Um. And then is there any current program in place for automobiles? Because 20 years ago, when they were considering hydrogen or electric, the government only chose electric, which I think was a mistake. They should have done both. Honda used to retrofit a car. I think it was the Fit. Was that their low-end car that you could actually convert it to hydrogen 20 years ago, 25 years ago? Okay. And are the, is any automobile company doing that? Or yeah, is it I, aftermarket? I believe uh, Toyota and Hyundai both have hydrogen fueled uh, cars on the market. Okay. Um, the Love's uh, company uh, of truck stops, right? Um, fueling centers, uh, they have a subsidiary company called Trillium. Okay. Uh, Trillium has a, a hydrogen fuel station in Naperville, okay. I believe. Uh, so there, there is some, you know, activity out there. Uh, you know, one of the thoughts with uh, being on the, the forefront, working with our communities and some of the programs, um, similar to like what Elgin, City of Elgin did cooperatively with waste management, they, they work to have them convert their uh, sanitation trucks to natural gas. And that city was part of that, you know, community outreach and a, a acceptance, you know, process. So that's something that, you know, could help um, by consumers being more familiar by being in trucking and other uses, and then, you know, maybe expand to, to personal automobiles. Well, I mean, and then the other regarding, you know, cause I know Mavis, every time transportation comes and asks for a new vehicle, the route I think going forward really should be hydrogen. What's the cost difference between, you know, get, uh, diesel and, you know, converting to hydrogen. I, and there again, it may have to be subsidized initially, by feds but if you want to grow the market you know that has to happen oh that i don't know specifics on generally my understanding is the federal you know the goal is to get the the cost of hydrogen down to where you know it can be it's competitive, competitive to electric in the market right. and that's only going to happen when more users come so i, th well, yeah. I think you're right in that the, the trucking industry is going to be one of the keys the key drivers um i know uh cr club or I'm not sure who said it, but that hydrogen makes sense for aviation and heavy duty and industry, but that we think that uh, lithium batteries is still the best way to go for smaller vehicles. Okay. And I don't know if that's- I, And I, I thought I've a, seen other articles that, you know, yeah. disagree. I mean, there again, you gotta let the market develop. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned the rainbow of how to convert hydrogen. Do you have a slide that you could pass on to us? That I know there's green, pink, gray, and I do. I, I actually had it in an earlier edition oh. of this presentation. I thought it was getting too I've long. I've heard it, but and, it would and be that's nice. the one we'd be very interested in. But um, could you? I I could explain it, or you could explain. Well, it. I'd like to have a slide for yeah. future educating people. Yeah. I think it's important. Sure, and I'm also reading articles that uh, proposing to that the hydrogen rainbow needs to go away. So interesting. I mean, in terms of a discussion point. Oh, well, on the other hand, I beg to differ because maybe, uh, Bates, please. Um, I'm calling on myself uh, because <laughs> the, the, the hydrogen rainbow is the way that we can tell if hydrogen is a clean fuel, a clean green fuel, or just another stinky use of coal, for example. If, if you're generating your, if you're creating your hydrogen from electricity that was generated by a fossil fuel, you're getting nowhere. On the other, so that would be like gray or brown hydrogen. On the other hand, a green hydrogen would be um, 
you know, made from solar or wind or hydro hydro energy. Uh, that that would be green. I believe pink is from uh, nuclear, which is that in between stage of uh, because nuclear is still not something you dig out of the ground, so it's maybe not as sustainable as the sun or the wind. So really, um, anybody who's trying to take the rainbow out is probably trying to sweep under the sweep under the rug the fact that hydrogen from fossil fuels is just another stinky fuel that's going to contribute to climate change. So please fight for that. Any other questions? So we will not, Mavis Bates, please. Um, so we will not be, um, there's, there's no discussion of creating hydrogen here. We will not be, Kane County will not become a creator of the hydrogen. We would be a storage or a, a pass-through yeah, so that's why I, I carefully worded the slide, you know, appropriate components of the economy, uh, because we're still learning about that. So, you know, the production of hydrogen takes a tremendous amount of water, yeah. even if you use a very clean electrolysis process. Uh, the Midwest hub um, proponent um, is proposing to use nuclear, uh, which we have an abundance of nuclear in, in the Illinois region, which I believe why they're successful uh, for the, being selected. Mm -hmm. uh, so we probably would not be producing, uh, I don't see producing in Kane County, but um, being appropriate, you know, storage or refueling or uh, other aspects, you know, of the economy, particularly workforce. Um, I mean, you need, you know, engineering, you need the construction, you need maintenance, you need operations, uh, fuel centers, all sorts of things uh, to participate in the economy. Okay. Madam Chair, I think- oh, the, Wait, I'm gonna call Mr. Yeah, Young. go ahead, yes. I just have one comment, and I'm, it's kind of funny, but um, if this stuff doesn't work, hydrogen, electric, I heard Wyoming alone has enough oil to power the United States for 300 years. Just saying. Well, that's, that's interesting. I, I don't, I'm... Just in case. I'm, I'm, and I, I don't mean to throw cold water on everything. I'm just, it's just a fact. I don't think this discussion, maybe Bates, yet, yeah, please. Um, <laughs> I don't think. Well, I'll, I'll call. I, I would uh, uh, just to ask it. for a point of attention to. The, I don't know that that's great, but I don't know. We want to discuss that. I, we do have a limited amount of time here. Absolutely. And I don't think it was a debate that we wanted to start. No. I was just suggesting that to Madam Chair. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have one final comment. Um, I think one other thing we could lead in is education and, you know, and getting facts, you know, because there's in so, or, you know, electric, there's too much hearsay going around, you know, rumors in non fact. And if we became the clearinghouse, I think that would give us a huge advantage helping small companies get to where we need to be, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not just jobs, but it's education that okay, you know, this program can help you get to hydrogen truck inexpensively or whatever. Right, and that's one reason I asked Mr. Van right, Kirchhoff and I think help. that's a huge advantage that we could lead the way on. Okay, any more questions from home or here? <laughs> from Zoom or here? Um, okay, um, Mr. Van Kirkhoff, I want to thank you immensely for, oh, could I ask one more question? <laughs> Uh, Blair, can we go back up to the slide that was about the one more, one more, one more, the the fan, the complicated picture? Stop. Okay. So the middle of this picture is where the hydrogen is being created. Is that right? The red building, I suppose. Oh, uh, they have well that whole green. Uh, oh, okay. Rectangle. So they have from uh, hydrogen from renewal renewables like wind and solar with electro electrolysis uh, and then they have the uh, uh, other power other power plants carbon free nuclear energy biofuels so they kind of you know have a few options they include in there okay so and all of these options mostly have pipelines or roads which would be truck tank tank trucks something like that so is this whole thing the hub or is this the green part the hub? No, I think that, there, I think this is mainly to just illustrate 
the complexity uh, of the hydrogen um, ecosystem, I okay. guess, for the continuum. So from production, which is in the green area, uh, the offtake are those um, areas kind of on the light blue squares, mm -hmm. um, everything from, you know, medium duty vehicles, heavy duty transportation, manufacturing, production of fertilizer, that's a big uh, aspect for the agricultural use, and then aviation. So I think they're just kind of trying to demonstrate the different markets uh, that could utilize hydrogen. So King County would not be the green box that we know of, correct? Probably not. Yes. Okay. Correct. But we could be the aviation box. We could be the, well, I don't know if anybody's making, we could definitely be the manufacturing, oh, manufacturing and refining. So that could be our manufacturers here in Kane County could be using hydrogen. The f heavy duty transportation, the fuel, fueling, that would be truck stops. the truck stops and medium duty vehicles down at the bottom. You know, that's like cranes or something. Or so, helping small companies get to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I did right. come up with one. Can they store the blended hydrogen and and natural gas underground like they do natural gas today? And that's huge. You know, instead of having tanks, they still have billions and billions of whatever the measurement is of natural gas underground. That, that I don't know in terms of a, a mix, you know, but I know that's one of the things that the uh, the Mach 2 hub is looking at with some of the potentials for storing hydrogen underground. Because I know NICOR has invested heavily into underground storage over the last 50 years. Okay. Well, any other questions? I think I'm done. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Van Kirkhoff, thank you so much for putting together this great presentation. And I hope you'll be back soon to keep us posted on, on how this is moving i mean it is exciting it is something it is a alternative fuel to fossil fuels so um you know it should be helpful in cleaning up our pollution i know the only pollution you get from hydrogen is water out the tailpipe something like that so um and it's going to help climate change and pollution so thank you very much okay moving right along to um miss ryan correct okay yep. All right, thank you. Um, thanks. Um, I do have to warn you, I have a little bit of a cold. I'm, I hope my voice um, holds out, but if it doesn't, please bear with me. Um, so this is the presentation where I get to tell you about all the material uh, that was collected and reported to us by the major waste haulers in the county. Uh, and then by our uh, collection partner at our recycling centers and by us directly at our events. So, um, and I, you know, kind of, Jennifer used to do this as well. I, um, our past recycling coordinator, kind of just update the same slide deck with new numbers, uh, but I can compare them a little bit um, to what we've seen in the past. Um, so essentially in the county, uh, we are reported uh, 184,000 households that receive curbside hauling service. 95% um, of those receive it through a franchised agreement through their municipality or township. Then the other 5% are receiving service by contracting individually um, with waste haulers. Those are unincorporated uh, residents. Just a reminder too, uh, there, there are not 184,000 households in Kane County. Um, the issue there is that we get a report for all of Aurora and all of Elgin and all of Algonquin, even though they you know, cross county borders and we just have to kind of live with that. Um, so the total household discards last year, that's everything that was put out on the curb, trash, recycling, and organic material. Um, was, you see it there, uh, just over a quarter million tons of material, uh, which is 1.38 tons per household. Um, that rate is down 3.3% uh, compared to last year. Um, then 
if you look at it at the household level, you're getting about 7.6 pounds per household or 2.7 pounds per household per day. And that that rate is down 3.8% from last year. Um, We're looking at a county diversion. So diversion is anything that was not landfilled. That would be your cycling and organics. Uh, The diversion rate last year, um, based on the hauler data for municipal uh, collections, was 31%. Um, I think that's down a little bit from last year. It was like 31.7%, something like that. Um, And I'll explain why in just a little bit. Um, The range that we saw when looking at each individual municipality individually was 22% to 37%. Um, So in terms of of trash, um, trash recycling and organics, you maybe remember this from last year. I've started trying to characterize it as how many uh, mega size container ships would our material fit into. Um, so that's kind of just uh, keep in mind each, each one of those giant uh, class, the largest class of container ship holds about 24,000 containers. So if you're looking at our trash, um, we fill the ship one and a half times uh, per year. That's um, it's down a little bit compared to last year. Um, 2.3% uh, the, the amount of trash went down. But in terms of, of the ship, it doesn't honestly change that much. I think we're at uh, 36,000 and change of those shipping units last year. And now we're at 35, uh, 35, eight. The recycling, um, unfortunately, we saw a bigger decrease there. Um, So we're filling the ship now less than once uh, with the recycling with about 21,000 of those shipping containers. Last year, we were at about 24,000. When looking at the weight, um, the weight of recycling collected went down 7.3% compared to last year. And then the organics is almost exactly the same. And you can see in the pie chart there just how the percentages break down. Um, Close to 70% of the amount of material that people put on the curb is trash. Um, 23.4% recycling and then about 7.5% organic material. Um, Just a couple notes about data gaps here. we know we don't get reported most of the organic material collected in the county. Um, well, at least at least a large chunk of it. I have no idea how much because we don't collect the information. Um, is backhauled by landscapers. You know that when you hire a landscaper, they're not only cutting your grass; they're taking the clippings and leaves or branches or whatever they're doing. They're taking the material with them, and they go to the facilities, the compost facilities, and dispose of it. Um, And it's probably quite a lot. Uh, And it really should be counted here, but we just don't have a way to get the data very well. Um, So to me, it's more illustrative to look at a long-term trend than just comparing one year to another, especially given um, some of the issues with the hauler data. I mean, the other problem with hauler data is we just have no way to ground ch- uh, to ground truth it. We kind of have to um, believe that it's accurate. If we notice wild discrepancies, like somehow a hauler collected twice the amount of trash in the same town but if from one year to another, we might ask them, like, "Hey, is this? You know, did you make a typo, <laughs> or is this is this for real?" And they may or may not get back to us and correct it. So. You know, it's, uh, that doesn't happen too often, but just, sure. Um, so looking at this graph right here, though, there is an increase. So you're talking about there's a decrease this year, but look at 2020 and 2021. Yeah. The world yeah. changed, right? So yeah. all those went up. Yeah. So maybe the decrease isn't a real true decrease just because we had two weird, really weird years. years right. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to talk about that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. 
Um, so I, I did present this graph last year as well. Um, the change obviously is that I uh, added the 2023 data point to our time series. Um, so with, with the solid waste, um, or the solid waste so with the trash, the garbage line, which is the green, the green points and the green uh, regression line there. Um, adding this year's data caused the slope of the trend line to decrease, um, which is good. <laughs> the slope of that line last year was forty three point two, which means if the you know if you follow the trend line year over year each household because that's what's being graphed on the y on the y axis there is the weight of material per household per year um so the the year over year increase has gone down from 43 pounds additional per year to 32.8 so we like to see that um, but the R squared value also went down a little bit from 8.4 to 7.3. So we're saying our, our data falls a little bit less in a really nice trend. Um, I think only time will tell, but I, I do agree with, <laughs> with what Sarah said. I think um, you, you, now that we're getting data beyond the pandemic, we do see that there's, there was that really noticeable COVID bump in the amount of trash that was coming out of people's houses, it makes sense because everyone was at home. Um, so not only were they probably generating more waste at home, but they were also, um, you know, sadly, and during lockdown and things, people were confined uh, and they spent time cleaning their homes, I think, kind of purging a lot of stuff. And that's being at home all the uh, time and eating at home all the time. So we do start to see that show up in the data for trash. Um, the, the recycling data is a little different. So um, adding this year's data, unfortunately, caused the slope of the trend line to decrease. Um, decrease is bad when you're looking at negative numbers and thinking about recycling. Um, so uh, last year, the slope of the line was negative 12.6. So that means year over year, each household would be putting out about 12 and a half pounds less recycling. Um, and now it's uh, at negative 15.7. So year over year putting out about 15 or close to 16 pounds less recycling. Um, and the R squared value, which is the strength of that linear relationship went up just a touch from 0.85 to 0.87. Um, unfortunately, again, this, this relationship um, sh showing this kind of year over year decrease in recycling is remarkably strong um, for any data involving human behavior. Um, and it's the opposite of what we want to see. Um, and, you know, people ask about this um, quite a lot. People ask, um, uh, just recently, one of the news stations got a hold of some public data from Naperville, and they have a very similar trend in Naperville. And they were asking, so does this mean people just aren't recycling anymore? Do people not not care? Are people just doing everything wrong? And uh, no, we, we absolutely do, don't know that um, because we know what is happening, but we don't know why without collecting a lot more information. Um, I know that lightweight weighting and, and changes in composition of packaging play quite a big role in this. Um, and light weighting can take a number of different forms. Um, certainly if a company changes their, say their beverage packaging from glass to either aluminum cans or plastic bottles. Uh, and if it's a big company that sells a lot of product, you're going to see that show up in your weight of recycling. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing, right? Because maybe the packaging is less is lighter it's, it's good from a transportation standpoint well you're, it would reduce our pounds but let's say i switched from a, a, a 1950s glass coke bottle to a which what, might weigh a pound or half a pound yeah to a tin can which lays weighs probably an ounce or two that but you're saying i'm wrong 
<laughs> no, I would, I would say changes from glass to aluminum would are, are good. Glass to plastic, I'm a little bit more agnostic on because our plastic recycling is not nearly as robust as our aluminum recycling. But, but for, for weight of, I'm trying to yeah. find a silver lining here, but yeah, maybe I'm... No, you're absolutely right. Like that kind of change causes the weight to go down. Mm -hmm. uh, and a similar example is when a company like Amazon or Walmart um, that ships a lot of product to people uh, changes their shipping packaging from a cardboard box to a to bubble mailers to any kind of flex flexible bag packaging. Mm -hmm. You see that show up in, in the recycling data too because. I mean, for one thing, the flexible packaging shouldn't be going in the recycling bin, but even if it is, it weighs a lot less than the cardboard box. So um, that might explain some of this relationship. It probably doesn't explain everything. I don't know if we'll ever get to the bottom of exactly why, but this is, uh, it makes it look not so good because yeah. our diversion rate keeps going down if our recycling goes down and trash goes up. And I'm sure. Yeah. Um, to, to take your point, if you went into the details and looked at aluminum and, and saw the weight in aluminum, and then you could calculate number of cans, you could say, oh, the cans are going up. So therefore that is a good thing versus glass. If you had it down to the glass level, you say that's going down. Yeah. They're going to be doing a statewide but, packaging needs assessment. And those are some of the questions, some of the data they're hoping to collect not not at a county level, but at a state level, like how much aluminum is being sold into Illinois? How many right. plastic bottles? How many glass bottles? But if we were able to capture it at the, at the product level or the waste, you would then be able to, to calculate, you know, your hypothesis, you know. Yeah. More data would, would help. It would. Um, and then the organics, there's basically no trends, no linear trend. Um, grass clippings it's mostly is dominated by landscape waste yeah Gra grass clippings leaves okay thank you um so you know a little bit of good news i do like to recognize the municipalities with the uh highest recycling rate um i did take organics out of this because i, I feel like it's maybe less comparable um across municipalities so this is just the amount of curbside recycling people are doing Pingree Grove is our gold medal winner this year. Um, they were second last year. St. Charles was a runner up last year and now they're in second place. Algonquin, third place and new entrant. Um, Gilbert's went down one to be a runner up. And then point of pride as a North Aurora resident, uh, North Aurora is our second runner up there. So um, just to, to clarify something, are, is, does, and I should have asked this five minutes ago, but does your data include incorporated and unincorporated King County or just our unincorporated King County? The whole, the whole data set includes unincorporated. Like these, this are okay. comparing municipalities. It's just the municipal. Okay. So yeah. when, when we're talking here, we're talking our unincorporated the numbers that you've been using here, like the former chart, that's this is everything. Everything. Okay. Um, actually, is it? I believe it is, yes. Yes, this is everything. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so this is looking at the commercial uh material that was reported to us. Um there are not that many changes uh, in this slide, honestly, compared to last year. Um, there are about 12,000 businesses in Kane County that um, the haulers reported as having commercial trash or recycling service. Unfortunately, only 50, uh, just short of 50%, 49% of those contracts include recycling service. Um, we do have an ordinance in King County that requires uh, commercial entities to have recycling if they produce recyclable material through their activities. It's possible there, you know, there are some businesses that just don't, by the nature of what they're doing, um, don't produce really any volume of um, recyclable materials. But um, 
I think there's just a lot that <laughs> that should happen and don't. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't really have the resources in our department to enforce the ordinance as it should be done. But it's where we're at. Um, the total commercial discards last year. So again, that's everything trash and recycling. Um, we're just a bit over 200,000 tons. Um, the rate, I'm, I guess I'm looking at this um, at kind of by resident, by King County resident, because that's how we put it into our solid waste management plan. Um, you say, you know, you're saying the commercial entities are, you know, they're part of the community and they're sort of generating waste on our behalf, I guess. So it adds to 2.2 pounds uh, per resident per day. Fortunately, the diversion rate uh, from businesses is just over 16%. So generally, businesses are not doing as good a job as recycling at recycling as resident residences are. Um, and then there's your you know, your material numbers, I'm not going to read them all off. Um, but uh, essentially, we're filling the, the boat again, at least one more time uh, with all the material coming for businesses. And 84% um, of that is trash. <laughs> and now, so um, it says up at the top there, that's non CDD. CDD is construction and demolition debris. Um, that'll be Next slide here. Um, so with the construction demolition debris, um, the amount reported to us was up 11.5% from the year prior. Um, so that's 62, uh, 542 tons of construction demolition debris reported. I know um, we don't, the, similar to the organics, there's just a lot of material that is not reported to us because it's backhauled by construction companies to, um, to construction demolition de debris facilities instead of being collected by the, haul the major waste haulers that do report to us. Um, what percentage of the um, of the material gets reported to us again we we really just unfortunately don't know um but for the material we do get the diversion rate uh is about 20 it was 28 percent which is up one percent over last year um and again you it, it's it's a relatively Although it's very heavy for what it is, it's a relatively small amount compared to the other uh, commercial waste and residential waste. So um, stepping away a little bit from hauler information and looking at our recycling centers, just a, a reminder, the centers we're talking about are gonna be uh, our West ND Center, our Batavia Center and our Aurora pop-up. And then for electronics, we're also counting material that's collected by LRS at their transfer in Elburn. Um, it is open to the public to drop off electronics there as well. And it is covered under our electronic recycling program. So uh, the centers collected a total of 576.9 tons of material. Um, it was down about three and a half percent compared to last year. Um, but it, you know, it's still a lot of material um, equivalent to about 38 and a half big commercial school buses or city buses in terms of the weight. Um, very similar to last year, we had over 11,000 residents served at our sites. Uh, we collected 487 tons of electronics. That was down one and a half percent over the year previous. Uh, 46 tons of textiles. Unfortunately, that was down close to 7%. Um, there's, there's just a lot of different places collecting textiles. So there's a lot of competition there, um, which maybe played a role, but um, not sure. Um, 23 tons of books and mixed paper, and then 20, about 21 tons of corrugated cardboard. The market, uh, especially for corrugated cardboard, has been really bad for the last year. Like they're getting 
maybe a dollar a ton, <laughs> you know, not, they're not getting much money uh, oh. for it. So I don't think they're too sad to see that decreasing uh, at the moment. There was a boom. There was a real COVID boom for uh, corrugated cardboard too. It like the went way up during the pandemic and then crashed right after. Um, this is just kind of fun. You know, we're not getting huge volume from this, um, but I did put a self-service kiosk um, at Fabian to collect um, some material that people might have a hard time getting rid of otherwise. Um, and so this is just for half a year because we only established that in July. Um, and in the half year, we collected about 10 banker boxes of inkjet cartridges, so about 100 pounds. Uh, seven boxes of art and uh, art and office supplies to be reused, about 70 pounds. Um, three boxes of flexible six packs pack rings. Um, those don't weigh a whole lot, so I didn't put a weight there. But honestly, we probably had well over a thousand of them. <laughs> um, and those those boxes actually get shipped out directly to a recycler. Um, only one box of the can holders, but but those things stack really, really well. So I did fill the box. And again, we probably had several hundred just in that, uh, that box. And then one, one box of eyeglasses. There are a lot of places where um, the Lions Clubs collect eyeglasses. So again, I think it's just a matter of um, there's lots of places you can take those. So we didn't get a ton. I love that. I think, uh, what what's that? Is it TerraCycle? Ter yeah, TerraCycle. It's a, it's a very interesting, but quite, I think it's a very strange paradigm where you pack up your recycling and you ship it to somebody and they will recycle like your Dorito bags that are crinkly plastic that are hard yeah. to, uh, this, is, this is better than TerraCycle. I, th I think so. I mean, even when we're shipping it out, um, TerraCycle is expensive. I don't pay anything to, right. to, and to ship out free anything. To our, free to our residents in yeah. King County. Because you, you had to pack this up and ship it and pay a lot, right? Yeah. So I think you're better than TerraCycle. Oh, thank you. I like to think so, too. <laughs> um, so now we'll, we'll just uh, take a, a quick look at what we did at our events. Um, 27.4 tons of documents shredded. Um, that was down 9% from 2002, but we had one less event. Um, we did three shred events in 2002, and we reduced it to two because we just weren't getting the volumes, both in terms of people coming and in material processed, and those trucks are expensive. So uh, we reduced it to two events last year and only saw a 9% decrease. So that kind of shows us to me, at least that two is maybe the right number of shroud events. And that's what we're doing this year as well. Important milestone as well. We've been collecting data about um, how much paper we've had recycled and shredded through these events since 2015. We hit 400 total tons um, at the end of 2023. So that's great. Um, about 11 tons of latex paint was collected. That's down a bit, uh, from last year. Again, a lot of competition. Um, 1,400 pounds of aerosols. That's up, uh, over hundred percent. I don't know why, uh, but I, I'll roll with it. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, just over a ton of batteries, um, collected from the public and recycled. Um, that was less than the year previous, but that doesn't make me sad because the batteries are very, very difficult, uh, to deal with. They're so, they're so heavy. There's so many different types. People don't know what they're bringing. It's, it's a lot to, to manage. Um, a little bit less than 500 pounds of batteries. Um, but that represents over 1500 mercury containing bulbs. Those would be your fluorescent tubes and CFLs. Um, that amount over 23, uh, up 23% from the year prior, about 300 pounds of styrofoam. We don't weigh the styrofoam, uh, really, it, it would be better to characterize it as about three quarters of a, a 53 foot trailer full of styrofoam. Um, just over a thousand pounds of bikes sent for repair and reuse. Unfortunately, that was down a bit, um, we had a really banger year for bikes in 2022 for whatever reason. 
Um, and then we collected 27 tons of dumped tires. Um, those are not collected from the public. Rather, those are collected from um, park districts, highway, highway, like township highway districts and municipal DPWs. Um, they're pulled off the side of road, out of ditches. Um, they kind of hold on to them for a little while. And periodically we have an IEPA sponsored event to collect them all and truck them off for recycling. Um, we don't have one this year. We'll definitely do one next year. Um, and then about 20 cubic yards of corrugated plastic campaign signs. Will Good. you do that again in November? Yeah, I hope. for okay. sure. Yep. Um, so our total impact of our program in 2023, this would be the events, the centers, and our household hazardous waste programs, which I talked to you about last time, is 720 tons of material. It's about 48 commercial buses or three 787s. It's a lot of stuff. Um, it's up 38 tons compared to last year. Uh, is mostly because of the changes at the HHW program in Naperville and the tire event is is contributing to most of that. Because you saw what I was talking about the centers, most of those materials went down a little bit, but that's why we're up overall. Okay, do a quick time check. All right. Um, no, inf information services, this is just a reminder, but it's another very important part of, of my job. Um, I answer thousands of public inquiries uh, via phone and email. My phone rings off the hook some days. Sarah will tell you, it's just like, yap, 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 yap. Um, I gave seven presentations last year. I, I realized I forgot to include or I didn't include Courtney's. Uh, Courtney gives a, a school presentations. So that's kind of how we've divided it up. Um, so there's more than just this going on. These, these were adult audience presentations, six on recycling, one on composting, I tabled at three community events, distributed over, or not over, uh, but 20,000 of the program postcards. Um, the recycling website uh, webpage continues to be very popular. Um, based on the Google Analytics, um, our recycling centers page um, is the fourth, the fourth most viewed page on the King County domain, um, close to 50,000 unique views by over 25,000 individuals. Um, other popular pages um, uh, in the recycling world are the events page, the home page, the hard to recycle A to Z list, um, also in the top 15 for the county. And um, about 140 unique views of the top 10 pages. Um, we had 16 recycling related posts uh, on the government's Facebook page, and I'm continuing to contribute to uh, King County Connects pieces. Yeah, Ms. Allen, at our at our 4-H Government Day uh, mm -hmm. festival, mm -hmm. um, we put together uh, packets of information that the kids could conceivably take home uh the next time they're asked to write an essay on government they might pull it out and look at it but uh just anecdotally um one of the kids looking through said oh as he pulled out the recycling guide and he said this is really good my mom posts it on the refrigerator and there's always some relative who comes in and takes it <laughs> off of the room and takes it with him so he, he said she would be really glad to have another one awesome <laughs> Good, good stuff. And then this is my final slide. It's just uh, to make sure you're remembering some things we have coming up. Um, we've moved our pop up from Aurora to the Geneva Park Day, um, Geneva Park District Earth Day celebration, which will be on April 20th at Pack Farm Park. Uh, we'll be collecting electronics, clothing, and textiles there. Um, I will be tabling at the Elgin Senior Health and Wellness Fair on April 26th, and then speaking uh, at Geneva Public Library at the end of the month. Uh, they wanted kind of an Earth Month uh, theme there. So very busy. Um, and then following all those, uh, we'll have our, our first event of the year at the Circuit Clerks Building. 
Um, just a reminder, what, what we're doing is one of the Shroud and More events. So we'll have the shrouding trucks uh, for them. We'll be doing uh, latex paint and aerosol recycling, uh, child car seat recycling, clothing, textile, and small home goods. Um, such as pillows, toys and games, um, small home decorative items, luggage, kitchenware, um, good stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's a good opportunity if anyone wants to get out and uh, meet the public um, for, for volunteers. I think we're doing, uh, King County Connects has definitely helped boost the, the message to get volunteers signing up. So we're doing fine. Uh, but if anyone would like to come, I'd be more than happy to have you. Um, and I'll leave it there. Yeah. And the one on the fourth, are you accepting electronics? No. Okay. What about, um, foam or styrofoam? No, nope. okay. that's, that's just the extravaganza. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. In July. And you may have one more, you may have to not use, um, ship large shipping ships anymore as a comparison with what happened in Baltimore. That was actually a really small ship compared to that one. It was oh, funny. Wow. Uh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think they're not going away though. Claire, yay <laughs> for all your hard work. Um, I, as I as I look at your numbers that are going down a little bit, I'm wondering if there's some kind of a support, better support that your committee could be giving you, and maybe uh, have a campaign or some kind of a bump for you. So let's talk about that. Sure. Okay. Uh, another question I had, and I noticed my recycling is going down because I'm learning what things I should not be putting in the recycling. Like the, for example, the containers, my husband buys a lot of frozen dinners and that box can't go into recycling. Is that still correct? Um, they do have a hard time recycling wet strength paper, especially that's intended to be frozen. So that goes into the trash. I'll have to stop him from doing that. Yeah, it's sprayed with a polymer. That <laughs> I think we can. may need some home education. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Claire. But let's work together to see what we can do to make your life better. <laughs> and I, I just, like the sound I of that. Just, I, what? I like the sound of that. Okay, good, good. okay, Ms. Hinshaw, let's move on to you. Yeah, good morning. Okay. Thank you. Yep, wrong way. Ah, so first, uh, I wanted to present about the solar project. The first month, our savings was 926 for just two weeks in December. And this will be ongoing, of course, and that will keep reporting to you the different savings. But so one half of 1% um, is what we have saved so far, is what we anticipate over the year. So about $2,500 um, for the month of February. So that's excellent. Okay, so yeah. let's hope that August and July and yeah. June just <laughs> pop up. Yes. It's picking up now, yeah. Good. The cycle's Good. going right up. Yeah. Uh, excellent. What well, a question. Yes, sir. Um, that's actual. What was it compared to what was projected that we would say? I don't know off the top of my head, but I can find that out for you. I think yeah. we should track that. The projected is a lot more than that. Yeah. yeah. It's mm -hmm. about 200,000 a year. Okay. Yeah. Now, did you and only. This is like a hundredth of that, All like right. 1% of. Well, question Did you project that at an annual basis or by month? No, annually. So it'd be so interesting to saying, track by month because it will vary by month, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's hope that. June, July, August, and make up for January and February. Yes, sir. I'm sure it will. This, this is Caius, uh, and uh, Roger Fonstock is was reported in uh, the building management uh, program that we, in order just to do this signups for the electricity and the offset, uh, it, it's going to take about 18 months to get a, because we start in the winter time. It's really low. It goes really high in the summer. It's definitely very psych cyclic. I've got it here on my computer. I show you what my solar does. It just goes oh. way up in the summertime, and then j starting in January and February is the worst time because it's like one percent of what yeah. you were saying. So uh, it was reported that it was going to take about eighteen months before we really get a, a good line of our annual. And I've seen that in my house as well. So thank you. 
And when it talks about savings, that's the initial savings from the word, that's not production. This, this is money. This is savings. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll yeah, keep, I we'll keep you posted. Thank you for that. Yes. That's great. Uh, all right. So we have our annual rain barrel sale coming up in compost sale that Claire and I will be running. If you're interested, um, it's with Upcycle is the company, up, right? Up in Morris, uh, but they'll be bringing up everything here um, to the Ben Creek Nature Center on May 10th. If you'd like to join, we already have, we put it out in King County Connects on the 9th and by the 10th, I already had six. So that's good. Uh -huh. yeah, hopefully that'll continue to go up. We're also kind of partnering with Elgin Elgin this year. Uh, they were going to have their own event, but I think they're just going to be promoting King County's event. And so then we're going to separate out who's with Elgin, who's with King County. Um, yeah. Okay. To kind of make it a bigger extravaganza. Question, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Is there a limit on how many rain barrels you're going to sell? Because I thought in the past there was a limit. I don't know. No, um, people. I mean, <laughs> people are kind of limited by how many they can transport for how many any individual could buy. But I don't think we've ever capped the total orders. Um, <laughs> we saw a big pandemic bump with this too. So I've I've seen Ivy's um, data from sales even before I was here, um, where yeah, we've sold hundreds. Okay, and then is there? somewhere on the website, the dimension of it. I mean, for people buying, <laughs> yes. whether it'll fit in my car or not, or. Um... Yeah, it, it's on the um, Clean Water for Cane okay. website, right? And then it's also on, now on the recycling pages as well. So. And how does the price compare to prior years? Um, I believe it's about yeah. the same. It's we'll gone see. up $5 this year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the real advantage here um, is that people don't have to pay a shipment cost, which is usually fairly high for a big old rain barrel. <laughs> yeah. And that I mean, retail price is around a hundred is what I've seen for a comparable barrel. So that's because I've been researching. We are a good deal. Yeah. Well, and, but that's only the barrel, right? Not the connections to hook it up to your gutter and all that. That's that's my understanding, correct? And then that you don't sell that. You have to buy that elsewhere. Okay. We do. No, they, they do sell connection kits. There's like a few different accessories. There's like little hoses. There's connection kits. There's bypass kits. Um, uh, that, so those are all available on those. Because you kind of need those in order to actually use your rain barrel. Oh, but... a, a, a little secret oh, I discovered is we have a, a sloping kind of tin roof, a small one. And we, we just put the rain barrel accidentally under the slope of this tin roof and it fills up. So if you have any roof that is kind of drippy, you know, because we had just gotten new gutters and my husband did not want to, um, and they're all painted and everything. So it fills up and then all you need is a hose and you're in business. So yeah, it has the valve on the right No, I know. Um, we have them at the museum, and we had an Eagle project done a couple years ago. Unfortunately, the quality that the scout did wasn't very good. We have a new Eagle project redoing it and adding a few more. So I think right now we had six, and I think we're going to eight or ten. Awesome. And one rainfall will fill a barrel. I know, yeah. Because yeah. it, we have good. no running water at the museum, so we need to. Um, I have a question. Um. How does the composter work? Does it tumble or anything? Or there, there's two composters available. There's a stationary one, which is basically just a black barrel, um, <laughs> with with aeration holes. Um, or there, they do sell a tumbling model, which is uh, the same barrel but um, lodged in a, in a kind of in a frame, so it sits off the ground and you can tumble it around. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because it is a barrel, especially when it's not super full with the stationary one, you can just knock it down and roll it a little bit and you'll get the same, same effect. I, you know, uh, I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of the Upcycle Products composters. Uh, we used to sell different ones that have become very difficult to obtain. 
Um, so we're looking at possibly different options for composters in future. My my, uh, my compost pile is sort of a, a pile on the ground and it works pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> mine is open air too. <laughs> okay, thanks. Moving along. No. Okay. okay. Oops, wrong way again. Our grant is submitted. <laughs> April 1st at like 4.30 p.m. <laughs> Plenty uh, of time to spare. It was due at, due at 11, midnight. 11 o'clock. Well, yes, 11 Eastern time. Uh, so a lot of hard work. Thank you for Mavis and uh, Chris, our consultant, immensely. Um, it ended up being 63 pages, if you count each page, and 54 spreadsheet tabs. <laughs> yeah, you guys are the queens of uh, tabs. Yeah, there was a lot. Um, so I'm going to just show you a little bit about the budget, a little bit about the greenhouse gas aspect of it. Um, one quick question: Can yeah. we get a digital copy of that grant just to review it? Pardon me. Can we get a digital copy of that grant just to review it? I don't. Yeah, want, I, I don't want a paper version. That's too much paper. <laughs> I can share our the main parts of it, not all the you know, the notice of intents and the extra cover sheet here, but I can share the main part of it with you for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is our money. <laughs> this is our budget. It took us, uh, Chris and I at 11 o'clock, we're going, okay, there's 75 cents off here in Elgin. There's a dollar 40 off here. And we got it off by like 30 cents. And we're like, okay, that's a rounding error. We're good. So um, I'm going to break it down a little bit and show you little pieces of it uh, in different sections. So this is our total was 114 million was our total amount that we applied for. We have contractual aspects of it, which include things like our financial auditor, uh, education practices, things such as group buys and you know, education for schools. Um, and for county staff uh, and municipality staff, um, that was a, a quite a nice expense there. Our total projects for Kane County, we put in 25 million. So that included all the window replacements, LED lights for all the buildings, um, dark sky compliant lights for the parking lots, AV chargers, uh, we did about 35 of them, um, about 16 or 17 or 18 of them were for either low income or public highways or for um, out in rural areas and the rest were for municipality buildings. And then we did also four uh, solar panel buildings as well. Okay. So, and then on total, all the sub awards, including all the different municipalities that we have um, ended up being about 62 million. We also incorporated King County staff, so state's attorney, treasurer, web developing, um, those aspects in it, about a million. So for a total of 114. Yeah. I'm trying not to spend it before we win. <laughs> it's hard to spend that much money. <laughs> it just takes a big grocery cart. To... We can apply for, if we, do, if we are awarded or when we are awarded, we can apply for advanced funds to start until they actually give out the full amount. So it's something that I'm looking to to start be able to move it along right away. Wow. Or, uh, question is uh, any of those retro for things we've already spent money on? No. Stuff, it all has to be new. So it's all yeah. going into the future. Great. Yep. Yes. Are you going to say anything else about? Okay. Oh, no. Next one. Okay. So our greenhouse gases. So this was, I mean, the budget spreadsheet and this one was an enormous. Um, so this is, these are, Strange numbers, um, very large numbers. <laughs> so this is over a 25 year pro um, period. So for just the King County projects, our building aspect of it with the retrofits, the, the LED lights, that was our biggest reduction for greenhouse gases. Um, but for total, for all of our projects was renewable energy. Almost every, not all, but most of the cities had substantial amount of uh, solar buildings that they were gonna do. Aurora, I think had, 14 buildings, um, DuPage had nine. So that was a big uh, amount that our reduction would be. For a grand total of 81 million or almost 82 million um, metric tons. And that it's, I may have a little comparison on the next slide because that number to me is just a number that's abstract in my head because um, it's such a large number. So again, this is over 25 years, but here's some comparisons. So 
in the you know trillions of numbers of gasoline powered vehicles same with gasoline being consumed um so yeah trillions that you're gonna save over time would you go back up this is amazing i want to acknowledge that would you just talk about the coalition go back up to that very small print spreadsheet to yes. talk about who's in the unless it's yes. coming to that so we have dupage county right and so it's broken down into year um and originally most everyone just said, here's my budget. And I actually split it up over the different years because I thought realistically, can't like DuPage is not going to do nine buildings all in one year. But the lucky thing with this grant is they are, they're like, here is the money. So even if we have something for EV chargers for um, Downers Grove and we say, okay, we put it in for the fourth year, we can take that out sooner. It doesn't have to go by this five-year budget. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have Aurora, again, mostly... Um, mostly solar panels. Naperville was all solar panels as well. Uh, and so I'm building um, LED lighting. Um, Downers Grove was EV chargers and solar panels. Um, Indian Prairie School, that was solar panels as well. Um, City of Elgin was all EV chargers. I think they had 30 something EV chargers. Same with Aurora. Aurora had close to 60 EV chargers that they were looking for. Um, I can't remember the name of the park. There's a big park and zoo in Aurora. They, what is it? Phillips Park, yeah, they wanted 40 charges just for that park. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there was a, a some kind of survey conducted, and that's what they had sorted out. Um, so in Will County, uh, mostly solar again, um, and some building retrofits. So the amazing thing about this, what you're looking at right now, is Sarah, Chris, Murphy, our consultant, I helped build a coalition that has never happened before. Will County, DuPage County, Kane County. Is Waukegan still in here? No, I guess. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Waukegan. Uh, Naperville, Batavia. This has never been seen on the face of the earth before. Mm -hmm. And this is this is something that in order to win this, um, this very competitive, honestly, very competitive race, uh, you have to be uh, transact transformational and serve low income communities and um, go big or go home. Mm -hmm. And we that's why we built up this coalition of $114 million and, and so uh, 14 approximately communities to go after this, this big bid. And like I said, I'm trying not to spend it before we win it. And one of the aspects of this too, is that with the, the all being partners or members, there's a little bit of distinction. Uh, we are planning on, we did group buys for EV chargers, for water heat, water source heat pumps, um, air source heat pumps, group buys and rebate programs. And so I kind of figured out those numbers and how many people and looked at past numbers on permits. And so that will also be part of it. And so each municipality, each town and city there will be part of that. So advertising that, maybe hosting an event in their town. So that's part of the agreement as well. Mr. Ross. Um, question. Um, the indirect charge, it's similar to ARPA that we're able to use part of the proceeds to charge off support of the program. And since we're the coordinator, right? Okay. Is that supporting all the other partners? that we're overseeing it. Yes. Oh, go ahead. So, so you that. Contractual part of it. So like the financial auditor that I know that there was represented off of ARPA. Yeah. yeah so it's yeah. just under 1.5 million, right. Over the five years that will get reimbursed to manage it. Is that, am I reading that correctly? For 1.5 is for King County direct staff. Oh no, that's the staff, but we're supporting the whole project, right? The page, et cetera. Yes. That's was my question. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so they'll do it's a this is a little time analogy. So I've passed through. So right, right we, they have to they have to do the project before we leave. Well, first right, so similar to ARP. Yeah. Okay, and then you kept, you've been mentioning the chargers. There's different levels of chargers. Most everyone put in for level two chargers uh, for municipality buildings. Uh, Batavia and myself, I believe, I put in a couple of level three for rural areas. I thought that would work better for rural areas because as you're driving through, you don't want to spend and, and three I'm not, hours there. And yeah. I don't remember what different levels are there. Three is fast. Okay. <laughs> Two is we the ones we have okay. here where it takes three or four hours sometimes. Okay. And level ones are bad, right? Because yeah, it takes that's, a yeah. week. 
said, <laughs> <laughs> so you run it out your bedroom window like yeah, I yeah. did for a year before I got my. Yeah. That was, um. One one other thing. Well, you get done and then I'll say one more. I, I think that was it. I just had this last slide because, okay. again, those numbers are just so astronomical. Um, again, but over 25 years, I thought it was pretty amazing to put up there. I love all those zeros. <laughs> I, I love billions and trillions. Yep. <laughs> we got some trillions. In there. Mm -hmm. So so one more, one more thing I wanted to say is the criteria for winning this. Another criteria is you take the number of dollars that it's going to cost to do this and you divide it by the greenhouse gas reduction, and whoever has the lowest number is good. Ours was $15 per metric ton. Do we know? We don't know if that's good or bad. I do, right? I do not know if that's good or bad. I don't have anything to compare that to um, realistically. Yeah, but that was our very end number. Because we don't know. So some of our friends are competing against us, by the way. So <laughs> we'll see. I'm not friends. <laughs> Go ahead, David. <laughs> Uh, Mr. David Young. Mr. Young. When you, that number is 82 million metric tons. And, and you said that that was what you will um, be reducing based upon King County buildings, right? If you go back to the slide before this, my question is, okay, so we're in a, we're in this building here. H how did you measure um, the amount of, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we currently are producing in, let's say, this building here mm -hmm. uh, to come up with part of your equation. So, for example, how would you take this building here and, and say what we're producing is producing this much so gas? So, I looked at, so for like the windows, I looked at the, there's an R factor on the windows. I looked at the difference between how indirect the light will be coming through or how it's shielded. And use a lot of it came from directly from EPA's calculations. Um, things like changing out heat pumps, EVs, we just, we use their direct converters. Um, that way we know that we're doing the right ones for sure, um, to match up with green with them. Um, a lot of the solar was all done by our, um, I guess, consultants, yeah. Arnie Shrapnel, um, the one who works on our solar panel out there. And so we use some of his numbers, um, <clears throat> which was great. Uh, and then just trying to figure out i used old numbers not old numbers but i use old um calculations from an older energy audit and used that that straight calculation and just kind of updated it with new numbers in terms of what the kilowatt per hour was now yeah. mr ross uh, a couple things um i remember there was a presentation a couple months ago it was projected we would doing the LED lights by itself would save us nine hundred and eighty thousand a year, and I calculate less than two and a half year payback. But that did not include the project that was reported. Was it at admin? You know, um, judicials upgrading their outside lights. So that's outside of this grant. Request. That was outside that one. But I have also calculated the parking lot lights, which I don't know the numbers off the top of my they head. They didn't. They didn't have a number when I asked that question last week. Do now. I can share that with you. Okay. Now, that calculation was also based off of um, incandescent lights. So I know there's a handful or more that has been changed to the fluorescent, but I don't know how many. Right. So that number might be larger than what we would be saving just because I don't know which ones are fluorescent and not across all the buildings. Right. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I, I just... Um, I'm popping my buttons because I'm so oh, proud of that. Sorry, course. one more. When will we hear back? Yes. Oh, that's a good one. I July. End of June, July. Yep. Thank you. Good presentation. Well, you. I, I thought it was August 1st. Do you think it'll be earlier than August I thought 1st? it. I thought it was the end of June or the beginning of July, and then we would be awarded the money starting in October. Don't spend it before you. <laughs> don't go out and spend all this. Okay. All right. Thank you. This is just. I'm popping all my buttons. I'm so proud of my staff. Claire. Just a quick question is, uh, have they announced at all how many applications were received? No, but I did hear uh, back in February, Edith Marka had talked about how there had been put in for the, top, so there's the different tiers, that there had already been 10 grants that were put into the top tier, which would have taken like 80 something percent of all the money. And that's not that those 10 grants are going to be um, given out, but just looking around, um, typing in, you know, Colorado and just different, it seems like a lot of states are applying for it. Um, but yeah, 
I mean, just in our, we have um, Cook County, um, us, the wastewater, um, I believe Pace, um, and then, but again, some of these are in different tiers. So that makes it different. You're not directly competing against a different tier. What, so, what tier did we apply for? Top tier. Top uh, tier, number one? Number two. Number, yeah. two. Okay. number one was 200 um, million. Oh, oh, yeah. good. So well, 150 to 200, yeah. Okay, so we were we were actually afraid to go into the top tier that that would be maybe more competitive, but uh, but we, we didn't want to shave off important projects. So. Well, LED light's critical. I mean, it save us a million a year. So, and I, I believe, so I've, I've made up a new word in life. I call it when if. <laughs> so when if we win, that'll be fantastic. When if something doesn't go the way we're hoping, we have built a coalition now that we can use for a lot of, you know, for for many many purposes, and and there there's more grants. We've we've really, you know, been yeah. Been I, pump and iron here. So well, I completely agree that even if this doesn't go through, we have this massive data set. Um, we looked at populations. We looked we looked at so much information there, and then again to share with all the people in the coalition that we can apply for the next one together or the next one after that together if needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe what's next. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're, you're done. Okay. Uh, this is all in the packet. So this was, this is available in the packet. Uh, so now we will move on to new business. Mr. Young, David Young. I just had new business here. I, <clears throat> I had this on my phone here. Um, I read in, <clears throat> it was a couple of months ago, there was a huge hailstorm in Texas and they had a large solar panel farm and the glass literally shattered and there were cadmium telluride uh, solar panels. And so now there's a fear that there was that material is going to be going into the soil and affecting their, their, their drinking water. So it, it's something that we uh, just need to be aware of. Uh, I, I don't know what the end result is, but you know, these are some of the risks that we have with with solar panels with large mm -hmm. hail like this. Okay, thank you for that. Well, one more thing to fix. Ms. Allen? Um, I'm sure that I'm redundant here, but I thought we should mention and get on the record at our committee that two cool things that I'm aware of that I wasn't aware of are going on having to do with trees. And one of them was reported by Kane County Connects that in St. Charles, that uh, area by the river is part of the National Old Growth Forest Network, which gives it, I believe, federal protection, uh, was already um, a nature preserve for Illinois, so that had state protection, but now federal as well. And um, in our emails was something that Montgomery uh, has uh, had an Arbor Day uh, festival, I guess, for years. And this year they added a poster contest because they figured the thing to do was to go after the kids. And if the kids could see a connection between trees and air and oxygen and good health, that, that would get them moving. And I thought that that was real appropriate because after all, that's a lot of the success of our recycling program happened because kids went home from school and said to their folks, mm -hmm. let's toss these cans and bottles into the recycle bin. Well, there's an idea. Okay. I think we need to talk. I'll just Sencha. quickly say that I'm starting this year and hopefully expanding it. I'm going to Geneva High School to give a talk about the Climate Action Plan um, in May. So hopefully, again, that will start spearing other things So to get more into high schools as well. So I really like that. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, poster, posters. Um, okay, um, chairs, comments. That's me. I do have some comments. Um, I want to say that this morning on the news, I heard that Oklahoma, somewhere in Oklahoma, they are creating a new factory to recycle um, lithium batteries. So in the past, we would, sh I think, shred lithium batteries and send them to China to be recycled. And now in the U.S., they're starting to recycle batteries. So, and as, as we work harder and harder to clean up the atmosphere, to 
stop air pollution, to stop climate change. We have to make sure that the solutions we are putting forward to stop climate change don't have unintended consequences. I hate unintended consequences. Maybe everybody does. And so that was good news on the radio today. And I wanted to tell you that I attended a tree ordinance seminar yesterday from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon. Uh, Karen Miller was there. She's not here today, uh, but um, Karen Miller was there. Chris, uh, I mean, Patrick Chess from um, sure. the Forest Preserve was there. And Francis, one of our um, state's attorneys, assistant SAOs, who is uh, helping to write the tree ordinance was there. And we loved it. Um, I have a little bit of show and tell here. My favorite one is, what is the value of a tree? Plenty. Uh, so uh, anyway, this is, uh, and uh, Mr. Ross said, well, maybe we could get some more copies of these from the, um, th these I'm, I, I just took for myself, but uh, it was a great event. We learned so much. I did anyway. When you know nothing, you can learn a lot in one day. Um, but I want to tell you that the total area of Kane County is 333,082 acres. The unincorporated area of Kane County is approximately 200,000 acres. So Kane County is actually, our jurisdiction is two thirds of the area of Kane County. That's a lot. That's a lot of trees to protect. So we will be back soon. Karen Miller will be presenting at our May meeting with the rough draft of the um, uh, ordinance. This is going to be so exciting. I know some people might not want to spend eight hours at a tree ordinance seminar, but you you don't know what you missed. So um, so we'll we'll, we'll have plenty of um, you know community input on the tree ordinance, and it's going to be great. So it's going to be wonderful. So those are my com. Oh, and I hope you all enjoyed the eclipse. Because even though I was trying to think, how does the eclipse relate to the environment? But I think when something beautiful and awesome and awe-inspiring happens on our Earth, it just reminds you more that we have to keep protecting it. Okay. Those Did are you say anything about the eclipse? I think the eclipse showed you where we are uh, in our place in the world and in space uh -huh. here on Earth, and it's worth protecting. It's worth protecting. So and. I have the shirt to prove it, yeah. which I ordered on Amazon the next day. But um, okay, I am I am done. Uh, I am ready to get jobs going. May I have a motion to uh, unanimously, uh, whatever? Here, yes. Mrs. Caius, I would ask for unanimous consent for the approval of the uh, uh, put to put the, the reports on file. Is there any objections? Okay, granted. Okay, thank you. Um, we have no executive session, so may I ask for a Roth motion? Roth will make a motion Roth. to adjourn. Well, second. Thank you. 